Hello and welcome to Vaping Unplugged, the podcast series of the World Vapors Alliance. I'm Michael and today our guest is Richard Pune from the UK. He's one of the early adopters who started vaping when most of us haven't heard of it. He's also a harm reduction advocate for almost 15 years now, so we are very happy to have him on the show. We are discussing his personal story, obviously, and his fantastic Safer Nicotine project, plus the current situation of harm reduction and vaping in the UK. Because today, when we are recording, the new government has announced um, a further crackdown on vaping. We still don't know what it is, but we still have, have had a look into it and see what might the future in the UK bring for us. So enjoy the episodes. Hello world. Welcome to the Vaping Unplugged podcast. Everything you need to know about vaping and tobacco harm reduction. Hello Richard and welcome to Vaping Unplugged. Great pleasure to have you on and thank you for your time. How are you doing? Hi, great, thank you. And it's um, very good to be here. Indeed, indeed. Um, maybe we kick it off with um, a very short background about yourself. What are you involved at the moment? Who are you? What are you doing all the time? And why, why okay. are you interested in the issue of harm reduction? Okay. Um, so um, going back to 2007, um, when I uh, saw um, e for the first time, and they were uh, little teeny tiny cigar like things, um, which uh, at the time I was sort of, I got one as a sort of a novelty and thinking maybe I could use it when I couldn't or wasn't able to smoke um, and um, ended up uh, getting quite interested in the, the kind of technology side and um, built myself a uh, an 18650 torch body mod, um, which at the time I was using um, 808 Penstar atomizers, and just because the cartridges at, for that time were quite big, they were 1.2 milliliters, which was huge compared to the little puff of uh, fluff ones that were in most of them. Um, and um, I noticed in about March of 2008, um, sorry, March of 2009, um, that um, I'd budgeted money for tobacco and um, looked in my account and it was still there. Uh, and that's, that is literally how I figured out that I'd quit smoking. So I'd, you're one, one of the typical- I literally quit by accident. So, yeah, so you're one of the accidental quitters, yeah, even I mean, though with the old school machines. Yeah, it took months to just sort of slowly take over. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd actually you know, only spotted it. And so I've got no quit date or anything in particular. Um, it's, it's literally just um, I noticed that I hadn't spent any money on tobacco for a whole month. It, it's funny because my story is exactly the same, basically. Just a couple of years later, I think for me it was 2015 or 16, and I never wanted to quit. But at some point, I real I thought to myself, when did, when did I buy the last time a pack of cigarettes and couldn't figure it out anymore? But I think it was less than three weeks. Yeah. I mean, and it came as you know, a little bit of a a surprise once I figured that out because I literally tried everything to give up smoking previously. Um, I mean, absolutely everything, including, um, you know, hypn hypnotism and acupuncture and nothing worked, nothing, absolutely nothing worked. And were um, you a heavy smoker? Um, uh, yeah, I used to smoke about 60 a day. Oh, wow. Um, my, my preferred cigarettes were uh, capstan full strength, which are, uh, unfiltered um you know they're still they're, they're tailor-made cigarettes but they're they're unfiltered and all that kind of thing and they i think they were the highest nicotine cigarettes available they're about um 3.4 milligrams per cigarette wow. and 60 of them per day yeah 
Wow. So I, I guess that already answers the next question. Why you are so enthusiastic about harm reduction that the personal um, story kind of, kind of explains it. Having tried everything to give up and not being successful and had a really bad time with, um, I think it was um, Chantix or Varicline, uh, which I shouldn't have had. And I, you know, I kind of even you know sort of lied to the doctors and said I don't have any psychiatric or you know mental issues and, and that wasn't strictly true. Um so they should have been contraindicated and even that didn't work. It just did all sorts of strange things to me and, and I turned into a, a, a completely different person but didn't give up smoking. It, till, <laughs> till you figured out vaping which is which is um, a, a very good story. Then, that was you know literally happened over a period of months it just took over from smoking and and you know accidentally quit which is astounding and lots uh, of politicians are still questioning if it works as a smoking cessation aid yeah um so um round about uh 2010 i kind of went to the first vape fest in the uk or actually no it was the second one and it was just in a pub it was just a a group of people who got together in a in a pub which we'd taken over for the for the um for the evening um and kind of met a few other people in you know the space uh some of the youtubers uh some of the manufacturers and um people who were really into it, early into e-liquid like um, decadent vapors um, and just you know it was still really early into vaping so everyone kind of knew each other and um, my father died later on that year and um, you know he was a firefighter and kind of he lived his life to, to save lives basically um, he enjoyed doing that and and it was basically in it for helping other people so i kind of decided that i should you know advocate for saving smokers lives in his name really um and uh that's kind of how the advocacy started um a bit later on i helped to write the um at that time first um UK and EU um, standards for vaping products. So um, partly through other people, and I also um, used to run a test house for testing against those standards, um, which I closed in 2016. Nice. I mean, so you you were also on the advocacy side very very early on. Yes. And maybe maybe we we look at at your current project or ongoing project the uh, safer nicotine wiki um yeah. before we go into it how did how did that start or what was the, the um, initiative for that i'm not entirely sure um i mean i i ended up buying a raspberry pi one of these little single board computers and um, kind of set myself up a mail server and um, you know, did some stuff just as a like a personal project um, and then a bit later on I kind of went well you know what's missing in vaping is a kind of a central location for um, you know all the information and you know, something like Wikipedia, but for vaping would be a good idea. So um, the the software that Wikipedia use, MediaWiki, is freeware. So it's open source software, so you can just download a copy and <laughs> install it. Um, so initially it started running on one Raspberry Pi. Uh, that fairly swiftly ran out of computing power because it's a teeny tiny little single board computer. Uh, so instead of moving to you know, actual PC server hardware and stuff, um, I ended up building a, a Bewolf cluster of 
uh, a number of Raspberry Pis. I mean, currently there are four that make up the, the wiki. So, and they run the web server software, the database backend, uh, the search engine, which is the open source version of Bing, basically, uh, called Elasticsearch. So everything is actually self-contained within the, the thing. And I run it from the hardware, you know, all the software operating system and up to you know, the internet connection, it's literally um, some Raspberry Pis bolted to the wall just over there that you can't see on the camera shot. I, I, I love it. You're not only an accidental quitter, but also an accidental educator. Um, it's a, a, a very nice thing. But let's say for for um, a vapor who doesn't know um, the page yet, what what does he expect? Let's, let's give it a well, practical um, example. Somebody wants to find out does nicotine cause cancer? What's what's oh, happening um, when he visits um, the page? The, the 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 sort of main page that loads when you go to safernicotine.wiki, uh, there's a bit of information on how to use the site. And um, because I run the search engine myself, it's kind of tuned for um, vaping related info. So you can type pretty much anything into the search box and um, it'll come up with suggestions of pages that are on the wiki, or it will then search through the text within the pages to find whatever you want. Um, it's sort of complicated, the background of how it does that. Um, it'll actually search the full text of articles and things which are linked, um, and it goes out on an occasional basis and, and actually goes through the, um, the linked um, papers and things and collects information the sort of technicalities of that is is not necessary to go into but and what what is the the general goal from your perspective of the of well, the project i mean initially it started out being somewhere to put all of the because i had a portable hard drive with you know just folders and folders full of um, scientific papers on vaping and information on, you know, giving up smoking and all that kind of stuff. And it was sort of a place where any, you know, anyone could put all of that information and then it would be searchable. Um, it would be usable by AI um, because they can access the data and, and use that, you know, effectively as, um, as their memory. Um, and also, uh, the the wiki is actually linked into the Wikipedia Commons sort of network. So, um, if you want an icon or an arrow or a graphic or a header for a page, the chances are it's already there. You can literally just search from the the editor, and you know most images that you want for icons and anything like that will already all, all be there ready for use. Um, the idea was initially, and not many actual end users have really signed up, which is a bit disappointing, um, was that um, anyone could, you know, create a little campaign page or even, um, you know, go and add a piece of science that was missing from a page to the pages that already exist. There are a few campaigns on there with you know, graphics for use. And um, I think it was World No Tobacco Day is on there and um, World Vaping Day, which was, um, that was um, an Australian guy who created that or came up with that idea and all the graphics and everything are available in different sizes you can just download or um, because it's a wiki you can you can actually hot link them to other pages or posts um, and anything you post on Twitter um, everything set up so that you get a nice preview of the page and the, the little um, box with the you know a few words in it appear and that's all generated automatically, so doesn't require any user input. 
And, and I also think from a even more general perspective, we all know that misperceptions about vaping are rampant. So that's why I really like this project because everyone who needs specific information can be directed there and is yeah. able to find the most up-to-date literature and scientific evidence. Yes. Um, so yeah. I, th I think that that can play a really, really good role. I think it's 74% of smokers who still believe vaping is um, yeah, equally that, or more harmful. That statistic's getting worse, mostly um, due to the kind of media campaigns against vaping, which is, you know, it's, it's really crazy that they're focusing on, you know, youth uptake when that's, you know, whatever it is, 5% or 10% of vapors, most of them are actually adults trying to give up smoking. So, um, yeah, there's still a lot of misperceptions out there. Um, that's, that, that's why we highly appreciate that the project. And I think it can be at least play one part in, in fighting back against this misinformation. The other thing with the wiki is um, it's entirely funded by consumers. There's no industry funding whatsoever, um, not even funded by government grants or um, anything like that. Um, it's literally um, a bunch of consumers because it's run here by me and um, the only sort of monthly cost is the internet connection. Um, we're able to do that on sort of a shoestring budget um, and, you know, trying to be as absolutely independent as as is possible like i say um anyone can create content and as long as they even the the anti-vaping crowds if they want to put pages of science up um then i wouldn't actually stop them that wouldn't be right to do that um but obviously it, other users can then criticize that or post links to to reasons that that's wrong um that's you know, having a discussion. So far, none of the anti-vaping people have taken me up on the offer to put anything up. But um, you know, it, the offer is there, and and I, you know, I wouldn't stop them. Yeah, it, unfortunately, it, most of them are not interested in actual debates, as it looks like. No, no, apparently not, because um, you know, my view is that you put the information out there, and you know it should stand on its own merits or not. It's it's kind of like with the community notes nowadays on Twitter, which are so fantastic when WHO spreads this misinformation um, to have some correction, at least there. Um, but what I really always enjoy because there is no WHO post without community notes anymore when it comes to vaping. Yeah. And, but unfortunately, before, before um, we need to end this misinformation, seems like to be the case in the UK as well. Um, while we are recording, the King's Speech happened two hours ago and they announced limitations on sales and marketing of vapes. I mean, that can be so but far... Already, I mean, it's already illegal to advertise them. Um, and, you know, it's already illegal to sell them to anybody under the age of 18, so... Yeah, I have I have seen some articles where media interprets this short statement as a flavor ban coming in. Um, do you do you feel that might be might be the case, or is that overblown? Um, well, I don't know. If you look at the consultation that they had on banning flavors, it was obviously kind of biased to try and direct people towards limiting flavors, which is actually a stupid thing to do because that's one of the the kind of replacements for the things that are missing in smoking and cigarettes is to be able to choose a flavor that you like um and you know that's for adults it's it's impossible to target children with flavors because there isn't a flavor that children like that adults don't or vice versa um once you get to about the age of two, um, flavor preference is pretty much, it's just humans, really, and things that people like. Um, yeah, it's it, it's 
really strange how they focus on flavors being targeted at kids. It's when it's not actually possible to target them. Yeah, and it's and, it's and alcohol and things are, are available in in you know all sorts of flavors which people freak out if it's e-cigs, but when it's vodka, they don't seem to, to you know have a problem with that. Yeah, and what's even more concerning when those kind of discussions are coming out from the UK, I used I used to run around and tell all international politicians follow the UK example, best case scenario. And now they, if they would implement something like that, that would be obviously disaster for the local vapors, but also for the international community, I think. Um, I mean, and as we've seen from Australia, all it does is promotes a huge black market, which actually makes things worse. Because if people want things, then you know, somebody will step in and supply them. Um, and if it's a black market or an illegal market or grey market of internet sales, then obviously all the age checks and you know, testing and standards go out the window. Um, and it, it actually does more harm than it does good. And from a, from a practical perspective, do you think this is will be actually done or is there some way consumers can fight back or is with this huge majority of the new governments um, done deal and we need to see what's happening i don't know something will happen um but i mean now would be if people are going to write to their mps and say that this um legislation i mean the the tobacco and vapes bill is kind of it's almost like a, a delaying action because it doesn't actually come into effect for you know at least 10 years before it starts actually stopping sales to anybody uh it'll be 20 years before any reduction in cancer has any effect on the uk on the uk nhs and um if um you know, vaping was put into the hands of older smokers now, uh, the minute they switch to vaping, their cancer risk starts to fall. The effect is immediate. I, that's one of the points that um, people could possibly make, that, that the, the tobacco and vapes bill doesn't actually do anything for years, and, and it's almost like a delaying action to keep everything as it is, or and also to you know gain extra powers over e-cigs while you know keeping tobacco on sale exactly as it is now yeah um, that doesn't seem right or fair really on people who smoke now um ideally getting information out to them that vaping is um not point not not four of the cancer risk of smoking and could po possibly save their life would do much more good than um, you know something which doesn't actually change the cancer rates until at least uh, 2030. Yeah, and it's it's also this um, typical reaction when we see some kind of moral panic where politicians think they need to show we are doing something, but this yeah, then, then they don't look at the actual ban. Um, actually makes things worse. Yeah. I mean, you only have to look at Australia to see how terribly wrong things have gone there. And that's because they tried to ban something which at least you know, enough people know that it's a lifesaver, um, that they're prepared to go to illegal markets controlled by criminal gangs, and hence, you know, fire bombings, turf war, um, you know, what was it three gang style executions over tobacco and illegal tobacco and vaping? Um, that's the last thing we need to bring to the UK or anywhere else. <laughs> very true, very true. There's nothing to add to that. Um, unfortunately, we are already running out of time, but before sure. we end, Richard, maybe you want to give the audience um, your contacts, where they can find you. Are you on Twitter? Where should they go if they want um, more information? 
I mean, obviously, uh, visit the wiki site. Um, if you've got an account there, you can message me there. Um, my email is uh, richard at pruin.co.uk. And you can find me on Twitter as Pruin Richard. Um, watch out for odd fake parody accounts and strange people. I don't know where they, I blocked them, but yeah, just watch out because they are using my picture and um, details. So just be careful if you're searching for Richard Pruin that you get the right one. It should be pretty obvious when you look at it. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Richard, for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure to having you here. Thank you for the update and hope to see you soon again. Okay, thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Some very interesting insights. I definitely recommend you to check out Safer Nicotine Wiki. It's a highly useful resource for scientific information and what's going on in the harm reduction and vaping world. Personally, you can find me on Twitter with the uh, handle Landl Michael. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. If you want to join us uh, as well, just drop me a, a short message. And I hope to be able to welcome you back soon at Vaping Unplugged. See you and vape on. Bye-bye.